this is a human. This is what we look like. This is what we act like. This is what everybody was like before us. This is what I am. I'm a throwback. I'm here. I've got the fire of human liberty. Welcome to God is Open. I am your host, Christopher Fisher, and we have today again on our program, Dr. Jonathan Fisher, and we are going to be uh, reviewing this video that's been weighing on my heart for quite some time. James White, last month, made a video about yours truly, about me, and about the, the Madden debate that I had on Isaiah 40 through 48. And that the subject of that debate was, does Isaiah 40 through 48 teach open theism? And it's actually pretty funny because uh, in that debate, I had a cascading list of reasons and points about why uh, Isaiah is teaching open theism there, all the, all the different uh, evidences of his perception of God. And what James White does is he goes to this and he pulls out what he thinks is my weakest point and then he attacks it and ridicules it and ignores all the other other points. So it doesn't seem like someone who is intellectually honest. It seems like someone with a vast amount of intellectual dishonesty to do this. And so what he's trying to do here, it seems to me, is just try to discredit me as a person so then you could ignore my other points. But uh, it's interesting. I, I don't think he actually, I think he's red pilling his audience a little bit here. He's giving them a preview of, uh, things that they might not have thought about. And so I think he's doing us a great service, not a disservice, a service by red pilling his audience for that. So John Fisher, welcome to the program. How are you today? I'm good. How are you doing? It's a great day today. It is fantastic. <laughs> this is Again, I've, I've been indisposed for like, like the last two months. And so then I saw this. I only saw bits and pieces of it because he's He's very hard to listen to for long stretches of time and very insufferable individual. And so I'll, I'll, I'll click around. Yeah, I, I brought you on here actually to torture you. Was, okay. That is actually what we're doing here. Uh-oh. I'm going to hit watch stream again. Get back to this stream. And we're going to hit play. But we're going over Isaiah. And I'm going to pull up the Isaiah passage that is in question. And this is in Isaiah 40:12. And this is uh, in the context of God's incomparability. It says, he will tend, this is 11, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He'll gather the lambs in his arms. He'll carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. And then it goes, verse 40, 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span? Enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and hills in a balance. So it's a rhetorical question. So is there an answer to this rhetorical question? John? Uh, the answer is that God has done this, but no one else. Yeah, so it, it's about incomparability. God is being described here. These are God's actions, and no one else can compare to that incomparability. The rhetorical question or answer is no one except God. God is greater than people who can't accomplish it. So then the question is, what is this describing? What can God in fact do? It says, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? So that's that's a very interesting phrase. And so the picture being drawn, correct me if you're not drawing this mental picture, uh, God has a large hand and encompassed in that hand is all the waters in existence on earth or in the heavens something like that and god is measuring him he, he's uh viewing it and counting the water is is that your mental picture of what's going on here it it seems to be that all the waters and, and it could be a reference to the waters of, of genesis even right um where it says that the spirit of the lord was moving on the face of the waters it, it seems to me that it's saying that it is in so tiny that it is within the hollows of his hand. Yeah, and uh, it's not just uh, you and me saying this. I have pulled up on my screen Mark Smith. And Mark Smith is a Hebrew scholar, a biblical scholar. He wrote The Origins of Biblical Monotheism. And here's his other book. The other, other book is pretty good, too, The Origins of Biblical Monotheism. That's good. But in his book, Where the Gods Are, Spatial Dimensions and Anthropomorphisms in the Biblical World, he talks about different bodies that God has. 
I think he also wrote one about uh, uh, about bodies. Oh, in his uh, Origins of Biblical Monotheism, he, he talks about different types of bodies of God as well. And so he ascribes this passage as an allusion to God's cosmic body. So God might have a normal body in Genesis 3 when he's walking the garden. He might have a really large body in Genesis uh not Genesis, Exodus 33, where Moses is in the cleft of the rocks and God covers him with his hand, passes by, and then allows him to see God's backside. But here is being described a cosmic body. He says, an allusion to the divine cosmic body is found in the question posed by the anonymous prophet of the exile in Isaiah 40, 12. Who has measured the waters with the hull of his hand and gauged the heavens with a span? The answer is God. This is the divine hand. It is so large that it can take in cosmic waters to the heavens. Do you think, uh, perhaps, go out on a limb here, do you think that that's uh, very conducive to Calvinism? Would Calvinists like that take of that verse? Well, I think they're just anthropomorphized or turn it turn everything into a metaphor. So I, I don't know if they would care one way or the other because you could you could just call it a metaphor and be done with it. All right. Right, but would they like that interpretation? Would would, oh, they would, would not like the cosmic interpretation? Oh, they would not. It'd be so. No. Uh, it's it's so funny. I think I think what's happening that's going to happen in this clip is an existential crisis for James White and fellow Calvinists. They they don't like the idea of God counting. God counting is an existential threat to a God who has predestined, determined everything, has this type of knowledge that's in innate. Uh, ungenerated that doesn't flow from outside himself counting is discursive even counting to one is discursive it's there there's order to it there's one thought before another and then it's from outside yourself you're receiving from outside yourself counting destroys calvinism if god counts calvinism is false existential crisis and we're gonna i think see that play out here and what's your guess having not seen this video of how he responds to this existential crisis, go for it. Um, probably insults anyone who doesn't agree with him. <laughs> insults and ridicule, laughter, laughter. <laughs> it's great. Ah, uh, so let's let's hit play and see what he says. These idols are nothing. That yeah, we're just picking a random spot because there's. I don't think there's a good like jumping off point. So he's he is talking about these Isaiah passages, uh, putting out what he believes. These Isaiah passages are saying they all, like the Babylonian gods, came out of the creation itself. But God does not. Yeah, listen to his God cadence. Does not learn from the creation because God is the source of the creation. Insufferable. He made all of it. If he made it, then he knows it perfectly if you make something you, you know it perfectly from that which he has made something, something right. completely false <laughs> yeah because it's something completely false if he made it he knows it perfectly you can't gain knowledge from something you made yourself what are you talking about i make things all the time i still i still don't know things fully that i've made and i learned yeah. things from things i made this is this is the lunacy of their position it's it's just like all sorts of non sequiturs added together, and th this is how they thrive. And it's Especially a little li if the thing you make is a lie. If the very uh, yeah. of it, it's that that there's unpredictability to the thing you made. I made a baby, and guess what? That baby st continues to do crazy things that I don't know anything <laughs> about. You know? Uh oh, I'm losing that stream. Watch stream uh, again. Yeah, I don't know why it does that. Yeah, it likes to kick me out of my own stream. Oh, uh, why is it doing it to me? Okay. Well, we're going to hit play again on that and see this if he is talks. This the argument. This is the argument against the Babylonian gods. It's the argument against the religions of men. This is what makes the, That's one, the, true argument. the one true God. So he thinks that the argument being presented here is God's knowledge. It's a trivia contest and... The, the defining feature of God is j God just has more facts and information in his head than these other gods. And but, so, I mean, so the, like, I don't think that you could say that the Babylonian gods don't have certain claims like this about them. They're they all do. 
So they all do. This is not an argument against Babylonian gods. It's distinguishing between God and man. Well, well, actually what's happening in Isaiah 40 through 48, it's called the trial of the false gods. And so God sets up this test to know that he's the true God and the other gods are the false gods. And, and the test is this. If God says what's going to happen before it happens, such that they that when it happens, they know that God's the one who did it, rather than the false gods and the the other the claim is that the false gods only tell you after the fact what the what the false gods do so it's not a knowledge claim it's not like oh i just have this special knowledge it's actually a power claim i say what i'm going to do and then i do it and then because i told you what i was going to do before i did it then you know because i already told you i was going to do it then you know it's just not this after the fact claiming of doing something it's like can your gods replicate this and so it's it's definitely not any knowledge claims it's not like oh god has a crystal ball and sees the future it's a power claim god can do what god says he's going to do and you know this because you heard him say what he's going to do and then that thing happened therefore god was the author and the, and the other gods don't have this that's that's what's what the claim is and so it's not it's not knowledge it's not like Oh, God's so special because he's got facts. Is that what the claim is for these verses, though? Um, for these verses, oh, it's it's a comparability claim to, I I guess man is one of the subjects here. Just in general, God's incomparable to any other being. So we'll hit play. There's the first point. I said I had two points. Oh man, so I just his mannerisms are in in themselves insufferable. His cadence, he's like man. <laughs> does this and then he does this like dramatic pause dramatic pause and then he screams again ah ah two points i don't know just uh just uh speaking techniques second point go ahead and take that down second Uh, point uh uh-huh yeah there is a possibility of prejudice on my part okay my analysis (laughs) of the arguments of the open theist that we'll be looking at oh. all right let's see uh, the man's name is chris fisher I've oh never heard of him before yeah I've me either because of warren mcgrew yeah warren mcgrew so he's a good guy I was listening to um some claim- yeah, there was a whole thing in between Warren McGrew and James White on Twitter where James White was claiming Warren McGrew said things that I actually said, and Warren McGrew's pointing out that he's just absolutely just lying through his teeth. And so James White uh, was caught in his multiple lies on Twitter and just wouldn't <laughs> fess up to it. It's, it. If you have this cult of personality, you don't want to ever admit when you're wrong or make mistakes. And so it's an interesting conversation. Claims that Warren McGrew made, and Warren McGrew, I looked at his materials, and he has this discussion on open theism, because I'm listening to his argumentation with Matt Slick, and I'm asking myself a question. What's his fundamental theology? He's a, he claims to be a former Calvinist. And so where is he theologically now as far as what he believes about god and so i look at his youtube thing and here's this recent thing on open theism i go okay let's see what he has to say about open theism that's gonna tell me a lot about where someone's going where their head is and what's primary to them because i'll be straight up front with you okay so let's also think about this uh people who care about who want to talk about people, that's a very low form of intellectual endeavor, discussing people. People can be interesting in circumstances if you're trying to figure out behaviors of human beings and and how people think and behave. But if, you're, if you care about theology and making theological points, those theological points should stand on their own, irrespective of the person making those arguments. And so if I'm quoting, quoting Christina Hayes, uh, she's an atheist. She's not even a, a Christian. She, do, she doesn't believe in the Bible, but she makes very valid points about what the Bible says. She's a very learn, learned scholar. And so it doesn't matter what her background is. Her points need to stand on his own. But James White wants to look at people's backgrounds and then judge them as people. And then that taints the arguments in his head. He is it, not an intellectual thinker. 
Right. It is very interesting that like if, there is some value to understanding a person who they associate with, who they talk, and, like who they who they prioritize for, who they quote, that sort of thing. But you would think that you would do it after you you investigate the claims itself. To to begin with that is to deliberately try to poison the audience. Oh, he tries uh, to poison heavy here. <laughs> so. If you're an open theist, it's because you are the essence of a man-centered theologian. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. That's So this is – have you ever heard these claims from Calvinists that uh, everyone else is man-centered theology? Did uh, you? I mean, the, the claim I heard is that, that open theists are trying to just make God a superman. Yeah, so – well, well, when Calvinists talk about uh, – open theism or any other theology even being man-centered they're like you always just focus on the man you're not focused on god and god's power and what god does uh, and then there was a discussion between will duffy and tyler vela in which uh, tyler vela is a calvinist and he's like god elected me and will duffy says why you he's like it's the he's like oh and he starts talking about himself so much that in the atheist pine ridge you know pine ridge right yeah. or P pine, yeah, creek. pine creek pine creek uh, one of those uh, geological features, Pine, Pine Cliff, I don't know. But uh, he made a compilation v video of Tyler Vela uh, interspersed with the Muffet going, me, 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 me. <laughs> it's so funny because Calvinists are the most man-centric people ever. They they care so much about themselves and their, their special election that... And it's so funny when they claim that other people are man-centered with their arrogance uh, is just beyond bounds. And I mean, so it sounds like they're not man-centered as much as self-centered. They don't care about mankind as much as the elect. Yeah, so it's it's a rhetorical device to say, oh, this other theology is well, man-centered. So it's it's the poisoning of the well that we, we see going on there. I'm God to be like you. God needs to think like you. God needs to have discursive thought like you. You have to limit God's speech patterns to yours and his thought patterns to yours. Where where do you think he got the little phrase discursive thought? Do you think that he thought uh, this up before he ever watched my interaction with Madden? I have no idea. No, definitely not. I, I would be very interested to see anything before this episode in which he uses the phrase discursive thought. but Because he, he probably didn't internalize it at all. Yours. That's what open theism is. It is a fundamental de deification of deity. That's what it is. And so, if you're going that. But I'm glad I added it to his vocabulary because now he's going to have to deal with it in all of his proof texts. If God thinks one thought, then another thought that invalidates classical theism in which God has all information at the forefront of his mind from all eternity and one thought doesn't lead to another because that invokes change and that inv invokes process, that invokes parts. God's knowledge is one simple act, all equal to each other. And so discursive thought destroys Calvinism. And that's what I focused on in the Isaiah debate, that God thinks things out. God does things in response to other things. This is all discursive. God has discursive thoughts. Isaiah was teaching open theism. And if God counts, if God counts, Calvinism is undone. Existential crisis activated. That direction. Well, yeah, so thought, he's, you know what? all he's doing is, is the thing called dignum deo. He's saying, I decided, I decided through my own reasoning what God should be. And anyone who says God is anything other than that, including the Bible, <laughs> is, is is not describing what is fitting for God. Yeah, that's it's really funny. Calvinists are like, uh, you can't say that you saved someone. God gets all the glory. But the Bible regularly says, oh, Paul saved these people. And he, like people, you could save uh, your friend if you do this. It's like the Bible doesn't talk like them. The Bible fundamentally, they yeah. would be criticizing the Bible. But th it's it's such a cult mindset that they it, they don't internalize the contradictions between what they're saying and the text that they pretend is uh -huh. supreme. I, I'm not just going to go to the end. I'm not just going to listen to clips. I'm going to listen to what's actually said. We're going to be fair. It's almost was well, an hour. Fantastic. Minutes, like I'm, if he if he watched it all. <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> well, no, he, he's going to pull so, clips out for this, but he didn't. He's interviewing this guy named Chris Fisher. Debating. And I was 
really put off oh, by Chris Fisher. We're, we're talking about this war <laughs> Yeah. Really put off by <laughs> most people are his arrogance. Yep. Um, and his anti, you know, th- they they complain in the program about how Calvinists. Yeah. With broad brushes all the way through the program. Both of them uh, I don't know. had brushes that were three miles wide. <laughs> it was, it, the, the, the fact that they could not hear themselves. <laughs> don't worry, James White. We also talk specifically about you. Yeah. People, they're worthless. They can't think straight. Uh, no sense even interacting with them. Yeah, I got a lot of stuff. Mm. Okay. I'm like, huh? all right. Yeah, everyone should go check out my uh, video, Calvinist Always Lie, which goes yeah. into detail about these people. But during this, he he mentioned the fact that he had done a debate with a Calvinist on Isaiah 40 through 48. I'm like, I got to find that. I've got to find that. Beautiful. Right? Beautiful. I, so I, I hope you listen to all that. So I go, I for the first time, I look at Chris Fisher's YouTube channel. Oof. Let's see, look at his laughter. You, you got a new fan. <laughs> hey, he's, he's got this chuckle. Just he's look like, at it oh, 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 oh. It, just look at it yourself. The, the thumbnails. I love it. He's red pilling. All these fluorescent colors. Look, look at this. Look at this. Warped faces. Look like a 14 year old gamer set. Really Fantastic. Like someone who is just addicted to first person shooter games. Yeah, and, okay. Ooh. And I, I'm just like, really? Seriously? Really? Seriously? And so I'm looking for this. I mean, this is like the boomerism response. They can't understand people Brandon younger than James. them at all. Here's this thumbnail. Oh, uh, yeah, he's like, like a boomer. Distorted. And so I need to be honest. So that's that's one thing about the thumbnails. It, 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 it signals to the audience not to take everything so seriously that um, it, it's hard to get destroyed as a human being if you don't take yourself or anything too overly seriously you the way you set yourself up to get destroyed internally is if you're james white you think you're a demigod everyone needs to worship you oh you're so smart i got a fake doctorate from a school that just exists as a room in some sort of random uh, abandoned building wait, uh, wait that's james white yeah it's james white he's got <laughs> an unaccredited doctorate and if you look up the school that is, I mean, some unaccredited doctorates are, are just fine. You probably went through all the right schooling and, and probably an actual building that exists. Uh, but you look up his alma mater and it's just like a random room in some random building somewhere. And then he's like, everyone needs to call me Dr. James White. Doctor, doctor. Okay, sure thing. Dr. James White, sure thing. You are a doctor. Uh, please fix my bones. Just with you. Fired it up. Within the first half minute, um, yeah, okay. Then the first half minute, um, this is this is what you get. Welcome to God is Open. I'm your host, Christopher Fisher. Today on God is Open, we're going to be defending James White. Now, I have no love for the man. I have no. Okay, so it, me defending James White, he's going to criticize. Okay, thank you, James White. Love for James White. Uh, which which goes to show you, there's no good deed that goes unpunished. You defend someone on some point, and they'll find something to criticize by you. So, it's like, do you even bother? Yeah, sometimes you do gotta bother and I mean, point you're out... Not, you're not doing it to impress James White. That's not why you're defending him. Yeah, you know, I'm defending him because I think he had made a point that was defensible in some context. Yeah. Absolutely. And so... Uh, no good deed goes unpunished, of course, and that's a rule for life. In fact, uh, I have to use screenshots of his conversations because he has blocked me on ah. Twitter for asking him a simple question. Is the it's human part so- of Jesus <laughs> God? He didn't want to answer that because... Uh, he- uh, you heard that story, right? <laughs> he just said that he's never heard of you until that debate. Yeah, well... He I, blocked you on Twitter? He's probably blocked a lot of people on Twitter, and so I'm probably one of the... just. Because, remember, his comments are off on his YouTube videos, so probably he just doesn't like people asking simple questions. Oh, oh and listen to him. Uh, he, after after this, he comes back on and he says, we answer a lot of questions. Oh, yeah, selective. Qu- okay, so like like Hillary Clinton 
when she had that big email scandal and she was supposed to be released like 50,000 emails and then she releases 30,000 and then all her defenders are like, well, she released 30,000 of their 50,000 emails. <laughs> and like, what? That, that, that's the stupidest thing in the world. What, what we want those other, the 20,000 that are missing are probably the ones that, that we bad. care to see. And so it doesn't matter how many questions you answer from who, the questions sure. you don't answer are probably the ones oh, that are yeah. important. <laughs> it's like these fake town halls people have where they already pre-select the people who are going to ask them questions. Uh, yeah, they're like, see, we answer questions. It, not the yeah. critical questions. Yeah. You, you blocked the person who asked a question. I did. I had like no interaction with the guy except for asking the question. So it's like one question blocked. That's the question <laughs> I needed answered. Gotta care about those other questions. He doesn't. Uh, answering that would not behoove his beliefs. Okay, I have... No earthly idea what he's talking about. Okay, um, the only <laughs> it person might be worthwhile to go look into it. Yeah. Some open thing I don't have blocked, so I don't know if that's him or not. Uh, my block list is very, very long. I wasn't going to invest the time to try to find some other thing, yeah. so I don't know. Um, I don't even know what that question is. I don't even know what the context of that question was. It's just I don't even know what his point is. Well, Who cares? Auto blocks people. <laughs> uh, the the question I just I just said the question. He just listened to the question. He could just quick answer the question. Um. So like like literally, he has the question with, and it doesn't need context. Is the human part of Jesus God? He doesn't need context. He could just go ahead and answer for us, but he doesn't. He just hems and haws. I, I don't know what this guy's trying to get at. Doesn't matter. That was a question that was asked to you. Doesn't matter my point. And can can you answer the question? I don't need other yeah. context, but he doesn't want it. He, he again refuses to answer the question. But it's not relevant uh, because yeah. he continued. He doesn't want to uh, actually tell us what he believes on that issue because it doesn't look good. Doesn't look good. He he instead blocks you. So he blocks you instead of answering questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he he blocks you instead of answering. Here's that questions. part. We never Here's the part. On this program. See, look at that. Uh, since Hillary Clinton, well, I released eighty percent of the emails. See, isn't that good enough? <laughs> I I went through and I selected the eighty percent that I I wanted to release. It was okay to release, and and uh, the other twenty percent you don't need to worry about because most of them were released. Uh, this is the thought process, and it's. I think his audience eats it up too. I think they're like, yeah, that sounds pretty reasonable. Is there a like dislike ratio on his video? Oh, uh, well, it, it doesn't, it doesn't seem doesn't look like, it's like showing that. Yeah, I don't know if it's. Uh, let me hit uh, dislike. I dislike. Nope, he doesn't show likes or dislikes and he doesn't have comments. <laughs> and so. Um, All right. As, well, sometimes it's okay to disable the dislikes. When I made fun of that pastor guy that was talking crazy, like, I had thousands of his followers coming to my video and complaining. Well, was, did you, like, and you had disabled the dislikes for that? Well, yeah, I disabled it's because... Very entertaining. It's, well, I, I think actually that one still has the dislikes enabled, but it's pretty funny how they'll just, like, swarm and they'll be like... Uh, because fine. sometimes there's mob mentality. and But if YouTube if YouTube sees a bunch of dislikes on your video, then they'll like derank it and they won't show it. Things like that. Which is really funny because that Google year in review, not Google, but that uh, YouTube year in review was the most disliked uh, video in all of YouTube history. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. People just dissed on youtube and they're deleting uh dislikes on that video too you can see the dislikes disappearing yeah they're trying to cover up their incompetence but that's another subject we'll just hit play on this dude the 1980s um the nearly 2,000 episodes of dividing line we never answer answer questions we don't answer questions in debates we don't do anything like that we do we not don't answer, answer questions give you an idea scum of humanity no uh, yeah. intellectual okay. integrity uh, wait a minute i i obviously you missed the the very beginning of this uh deep section here Let's... so i had james white followers coming to me is like you called james white the scum of humanity yeah i'll do it again he's the scum of humanity as evidenced by this video he just he just heard the question that i i cared deeply for him to answer and he again didn't answer it and then he's going on this this hitman thing against me, using laughter and ridicule and not answering and and uh, poisoning the well. That's what he does. Not a good person. Horrible, horrible human being. Let's try it again. Instead, blocks you. 
So he blocks you instead yeah. of answering questions. Absolute scum of humanity. No That's right. Intellectual integrity. Very <laughs> bad individual. In fact, he was in a race for the most garbage human being. I love it. And, I love it. Uh, and he's playing it. Were James White and Matt Slick. Well, now you know he's seen this. When I was the judge, I would have to go with, um, huh, this is a hard one, so it's carry the one. Um <laughs> Yeah, James White gets the trophy. Most uh, garbage human being. Okay, so on the uh, garbage uh, human uh, being, uh, I, I want to be upfront. Okay, watch this. Watch you this. Know, um, that uh, I am aware of the fact that that Chris Fisher is not my biggest fan, and um, we're not not looking for any interaction with the man because he said he he just said it there. He said it with Warren McGrew. We're not even worthy talk watch. from his perspective. We are so dishonest. We are such stupid people. That there's no reason to even talk with us. So uh, I'm just going to demonstrate that the man doesn't have a clue of what he's talking about, and then we move on from there because he's he's laid the foundation of the discussion, and and there you go. He does have a 500 page book on open theater. Okay, so watch the framing there. So um, he framed it as like like his followers were coming to me and saying you should go debate James White, and so. James White is just framing this as I never want to have a discussion with Chris Fisher because he doesn't have respect for me and he's called me these names. <laughs> and he's framing it as I don't want to talk to him and that I wouldn't want to debate him. I wouldn't want to talk to him in any setting. If it was a moderated debate with like a neutral third party, maybe it's an Arminian who doesn't care about open theism or Calvinism or something like that. If there's a debate with a third party. I would love to debate James White, it could be about the exact same topic. And in fact, I'll do one better. I will have the exact same opening statement that I had with Madden in the in the Madden debate about does Isaiah 40 through 48 teach open theism? And I, word for word, except for I think there's one reference change I needed to do. But other than that, the, the intro would be perfect. So he'd have all my cards. I'd love to hear his response to my actual <laughs> arguments. And I will do that debate. He'll have my entire opening statement. I'll do it. I'll do it. It'd be fantastic. But his framing for his audience is, this guy doesn't want to talk to me, and so I'm out. I don't want any interaction with him. So uh, it's, it's I'm the problem. I've, He's not I've, the problem. The entire reason you're calling him a garbage person is because he blocks and mutes and, and silences anyone who disagrees with him. And then he says that, oh, well, he, he doesn't want to have any interaction with me. It's like... Like I tried. <laughs> I mean, that's the reason you hate him. <laughs> yeah, and so if you go to God is Open and you type in James White, I've been documenting his intellectual dishonesty for quite some time. There's uh, interactions with him about uh, surveyatus with uh, different individuals. I've just been documenting times in which this guy has exercised intellectual dishonest, disintegrity, disintegrity. And so he is the problem. He's a bad person. And he's not going to internalize this and change because guess what? He's a grifter. If he internalized it and changed, he's probably going to lose a lot of his money. Hey, he's, likely, yeah. he's a charlatan out there just preaching to his choir who feeds him money. But it's more of this kind of exegesis. Now, the debate was between Chris Fisher and a fellow by the name of Daniel Madden. Brother Madden, thank you for your patience. Uh, I think you did a wonderful job. Uh, your presentation was clear. I mean, 10 minutes ain't long enough for almost anything. Uh, but given the type of person you were interacting with, great thumbs up. Look up Daniel Madden. I, if, if we've met, sir, I... Right. I would, I would like anyone to show any bit of disrespect I gave Madden in my debate with him. And he's a Calvinist. And I didn't because he's a generally, genuinely good person. Uh, Madden, uh, I like him very much, and I like interacting and talking to him. And, and uh, he seems to at least um, have tact and awareness, and uh, actually willingness to interact in an honest way. Not all Calvinists do. Not all Calvinists do. Uh, not James White. So some interactions like that with Calvinists are in fact possible, as demonstrated by that debate. And so, and there's then there's other debates where I'm dealing with hostile Calvinists. There's there's another Calvinist I interacted with that I had that recorded and I, I posted that where I'm debating about Isaiah. And that guy was just a 
complete tool. And so I, I treated him like a complete tool. You, if you act like a tool, you're going to be treated like a tool. It, you, you mirror the person you're interacting with. That, that's my general strategy for life. You just don't go out of your way to be hostile and, and uh, yeah, you mirror the person. If that's how they're going to act, that's their personality. That's how they need to be treated because they don't care at that point. At that point, it's pretty obvious that they're not in this for the intellectual conversation, exchange of information, understanding. They're in it to score political points. Demagoguery is what they're trying to get. Little quote sound bites. Any comments on that? You, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I have a general sense. And so it seems like you treat them with respect until they stop showing you respect. Right. But and, the, and the reason you do this is that um, you have to you have to gauge whether there's any value to the discussion. Like this, this, this is true in general about discussing with people. People complain all the time about what aboutism, and what aboutism is this idea that uh, you you start talking about something other than what they want you to talk about to sort of gauge the general principle of, of the thing that we're talking about. The reason you bring it up, like, oh, if it's okay to, to uh, I don't know, if, if it's okay for this person to steal, is it okay for this person to steal? That's just trying to generalize the general consistency of the person you're dealing with. Now, they want to talk about a certain thing, and then they get mad at you if you try to understand the general principle and start complaining what aboutism. And that is what, what aboutism actually is what tells you that this person is either intellectually honest and generalizable, or if he's just selling you a line that he thinks you'll, you'll give in to whatever argument he wants at that given time. So I, like, I, I think uh, in general, you, wa you want to understand if you're going to engage with anyone, you need to, the very first thing you have to do is understand whether or not there, there's going to be some sort of honest, serious investigation of a question or you want to know if this is just sort of like they're taking you for a ride. And that completely changes the way that you try to approach the subject in the first place. Yeah, there, there are valid criticisms of whataboutism. So if I say women are a standard deviation below men on the IQ spectrum, and then someone says, well, what about uh, Christine Hayes, biblical scholar? She's incredibly intelligent. Like, well, that's, that doesn't invalidate what I just said because what I'm dealing with is averages and you're trying to pull out a data point. But, but, that, that, but that's not criticizing what aboutism. That's responding to it and saying, hey, that fits the general rule. The criticism, the, the what aboutism claim is saying, hey, we don't want to talk about that because it's not relevant. That you're trying to avoid the, the, the topic itself. You're not doing that with your response there. Mm. You're, actually, you're actually contributing to the idea of the general principle that you state. And so that that's, it's not a problem that they ask something like that so you can establish the bounds of the argument and you can understand the general principle that you make. What happens instead, though, is that they basically have no consistency, and especially when a person has no consistency or argumentation, he's trying to latch on to something that you care deeply about, like you have some sort of moral framework, but he's not going to apply that to himself so that you come to a consensus. He's just trying to get you to cave to whatever he's saying at a certain time. But he's never going to apply the very same thing to himself. And that tells you that this person is being dishonest with you. I think what aboutism is not a problem. It is the very beginning stages of any discussion that you have with a person just to gauge whether or not they're worthwhile to talk to. Yeah, there's... I think I think there are some boundary settings. So, for example, it would have to be, but in general, I like, think that like libertarians will say, "Oh, uh, whatever private company wants to do is their prerogative." And so, if Twitter wants to uh, have a monopoly, a, a, a practical monopoly on all social conversation, and then silence anyone they want to, that's the same as a random bake a cake bakery in Colorado not servicing. A uh, certain person who wants a certain cake baked. It's like not quite the same thing because of the scale and the availability of what's going on there. And it doesn't, it's not necessarily a hard and fast principle of where you draw the line on what you're actually fighting in the, in the social realm. At, at what point it's uh, acceptable or not acceptable to deny services based on freedom of association. Well, I think freedom of association is the big question here because you can't really call Twitter a private company since they are very much restricted by the government of who they should be allowed to hire. 
All right. So, but anyways, anyways, moving back to theology rather than Twitter politics. Yeah. Uh, Context wise, (laughs) I I would love to uh, get in touch with you and and congratulate you directly. But um, the debate was the debate thesis was Isaiah 40 to 48 teaches open theism. Yes. Beautiful. Oh, I love it. I love it so much. Okay. How in the world do you get that from what we just read? Uh, because uh, I, I gave a big list of uh, evidences. <laughs> did, did you did you watch that part of the debate, James? What do you want? Do you want? Do you want to actually uh, go over that with your audience of what I said and why? Oh, you don't. Okay, that's fine. Uh, just don't well, do that. Make then. a funny face instead. Yeah, he could do this. <laughs> His funny face. He's like, hmm. How, how did did you listen to the debate? I I was there. I I, I did explain. Come on, anything, James White. Okay, all right. Just just focus on one of my points then. Okay. Well, one of the key things that Chris Fisher kept going back to, yeah, is Did that I? God learns things. Yeah. Okay, I know the text said, "From who has he gained knowledge?" Who, and it was all rhetorical and meant. And the answer is nobody. Okay, so let let's see if those two things are exclusive. Uh, not learning from somebody. And not learning are those two things uh, mutually exclusive, or do they? Do, does one necessitate the other? If you don't learn from anyone, does that mean you never learn anything ever in any context? Obviously, that the answer is no. <laughs> Obviously, no. But uh, in the, in his the mind, text doesn't even the text doesn't even say that, does it? Uh, the text says who has been his counselor. So basically, the idea is these kings in the ancient time had counselors people who would give them advice and they would do it and and uh but uh, the funny thing is that in second kings 22 there were there were angels who were god's counselor god has a divine assembly and says hey how are we going to kill this ahab guy and then all these different angels offer different ideas and then god mm-hmm. picks one and so you got a tangible counterexample of people actually giving advice to god which god accepts but I don't think Isaiah is about that. I don't think it's like, did God ever uh, accept somebody's suggestion for how to act? I think this is about someone controlling God uh, through giving him all sorts of superior advice. Maybe like like in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, there's like that uh, there's that counselor who like controls the king and, and tells him what to do and the king's all weak and getting pulled around. I think the general idea of Isaiah is God's not a weak king. Yeah, God will listen to people and hear what they have to say, but God's not being guided around by counselors. I think that's the general principle, which he takes as a metaphysical absolute. Uh, what this means when, when the text says, who has been God's counselor? It means no one in any circumstance ever, no matter how minute, also it's a metaphysical absolute. That's what he it, reads from the verse. It is very interesting to see how quickly you bounce well, he bounces between metaphysical absolutes for this, and but the very couple sentences before that are definitely metaphors, meant not meant to be taken directly. Right. And, and, and the only hermeneutic he uses to determine the difference between this is what he wants to believe in the first place. What do I have to say to make you do what I want? make you believe my theology. That's that's his only guiding principle in life. What do I have to say to make you believe my theology? It's it's uh, very sketchy. This is why I rank him number one worst person. But when in the opening statement, Chris Fisher goes through, and one of the arguments that he makes one is that God learns because He's counting the waters. Yeah, now we're back to the counting. <laughs> he's counting the waters. Who has measured the waters in the palm of His hand? In in credulity. So uh, if if you you hear a debate point that you don't like, you just treat it to, with incredulity. You're, you're like, oh, who could ever say that? And uh, like his co-host later, I don't know if we're going to get that far, but he laughs. His co-host is like, ha, 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 God, counting, ah, oh, oh, okay, okay, next point. Let's move on. Oh, that was. It it sounds like the answer is not God. (laughs) Ah, That ah, that seems ah. to be his answer. (laughs) Oh, God, 
That doesn't count. Oh, man. Oh, that was so funny. I, you, Let's you move on. Just, you should just ask, does God count? <laughs> was, is that what you asked during the debate? Uh, no, I pointed out that Isaiah 40, uh, that's one of my multiple points. I ain't skipping all the rest. Uh, uh, one of my multiple points is that God counts. God counting is an existential crisis to Calvinism, which is why he treats it as a laughable claim. Ha, ha, ha. God so, counting. So, let's see what he actually says or if this okay. is the end of his argument. So God is counting. And so God is learning how much water yeah. there is in his creation. Yep. Rich just fell out of his chair. See? Oh, there okay. goes Rich. Bye. Bye, Rich. Um, you might okay. say, no, come on. No. That's what he said. Okay. Oh, come on. God counting? Oh, oh the, the text definitely doesn't. There's no way to read the text like that. Who could ever read that text that God is counting? Oh, it's so ludicrous. And in his rebuttal, uh, our Calvinist brother Madden pointed out that this is, this is an absurd reading. Oh, it's just absurd. What is being said. It's saying God is the standard. I mean, I mean, let, let me let me remind you. Wait, what? Of the the specific. Okay, so uh, Madden, uh, I think he's he might pull it up here, but Madden's claim was this is saying that God is the standard for all creation, and that's what this text is actually describing. I mean, uh, I, 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 I'm sorry, that doesn't sound like a coherent response. Right. Uh, not, if if God God is a measuring stick, then that stick has to measure something still right well yeah so it's a, it, i think the only way that what he's saying could be true is if god is everything i think that's the only logical uh conclusion from the claim that god is the standard yeah so let's hit play real quick and then i got another real specific funny words point we're used here. It's, it's isaiah 40 verse 12 who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span so it's not just yeah. water yeah, yeah, it's, it's all measurements and calculations. Yes. And calculated the dust of the earth by measure. All so counting. Dust, whatever, <laughs> however you define that. And weighed the mountains in a balance. So evidently yep. God is also going, I wonder what the mountains weigh. Yeah. So what does the text say? So that's that's why actually I had the debate phrased the way I did. Does Isaiah 40 through 48 teach open theism? Because then you can't say, oh, that's so ridiculous. Well, what does the text say? What does the text mean? Well, the text says that God's measuring, so what do you do with it? I'm not asking if you believe it. What in in the context makes you think otherwise, that God's not counting? And then he's he's got nothing. He's got his presupposition. So that's probably why, thinking presuppositionally, we got to have our Calvinism before we come to the text, or else guess what? If, if, if we don't have our Calvinism before we come to the text, and, and the text says God counts, we might think that shock and horror... God counts. Ah! Oh! Then they have a heart attack. <laughs> that, that's that's it's real, literally the subject of the debate. And the hills in a pair of scales. Yeah. Now, for the vast majority of human beings, and and this is funny because Chris Fisher likes to reduce all this because I don't get the feeling. Chris Fisher said to Warren McGrew that his dad knew biblical Hebrew, not Morin's, but, but Chris Fisher's dad knew biblical Hebrew. I don't get the feeling that the man actually knows the language <laughs> as in uh, uh, being able uh. to actually read it. And so what he likes. Okay. So he I, yeah, I wonder if James Wycat. So my dad was educated at Jerusalem university in Israel and speaks Hebrew fluently to such an extent that he was regularly uh, mistaken for a Jew. I, the, he, a, a speaking, practicing Israelite, he is regularly mistaken for that. The only thing James White has ever been mistaken for was a recently deceased drag queen. That's that's the only thing anyone ever has mistaken him for. And so he's making digs on my dad, uh, who's, who speaks Hebrew. That's fine. But guess what? Who he also di makes digs at? Uh, how about Mark Smith? We just talked about Mark Smith, Hebrew scholar. How about in the biblical word commentary? On Isaiah, I think it's about Mark Watts is the guy's name, and he talks about it. I just pulled it up, and it, this is all about measuring devices, and I'm going to read it. Hand's breadth refers to a measurement, half a cubit. 
The inadequacy of human measures or devices of forming any estimation larger than things in creation is the point here. Modern measures and devices can measure in a way much larger and greater things than could those of biblical times, but they too are limited. One would have to change the metaphor to show their limits. God can measure much better than we can. And this is by John D. Watts. And so I, I got that name right. So there's two more biblical scholars for you. How do you like them apples? I might not be fluent in Hebrew, but I did sleep at a Holiday Inn Express last night. I think the saying goes. <laughs> to do is he likes to talk about basic reading comprehension. Yeah. That's a good thing. Excusing I'm still waiting for him to actually give a response. Okay, so let's let's say let's do a thought experiment. I I don't think I did this thought experiment to Madden during the debate, but I, I certainly would if I ever debated James White on this. If we took this passage to the mall and found five people who aren't necessarily Christians, but uh, who are well dressed, which kind of signifies maybe they they can in fact read, and we presented them this passage, how many of them would have Madden's reading of this? My, my guess, in my head, my prediction of the future, my omniscience, uh, zero people would have Madden's uh, reading of this. And and my, my other prediction is a greater than zero number would think that this is talking about God measuring water. Uh, what do you think about my predictions? I, I think you're not even... Um predicting with as much certainty as you can you probably say more than 50 percent will yeah probably what... probably well well you, like you don't present them options you just have them read the verse and say what's going uh -huh. on in this verse what does it mean yeah kind of to just describe what's what this is uh trying to mean and zero people are going to come away with madden's reading and more than zero are going to come away with mine so i think i think maybe maybe i yeah. might be on to something here <laughs> Yeah, maybe he needs to actually address the the issue at the core. Like <laughs> he doesn't even acknowledge that this is pro a problem for him, where people will naturally read it differently than what he's telling you. Instead, what he says is, "This is the only thing you should think about." I know it could be something else. No, no, he doesn't say that. He says, yeah. "It's the only possible thing you could ever come up with." And if someone else does something else, I'm just gonna fall out of my chair. It gets worse than this because he plays parts of the debate in which Madden, I, I point out that this verse is about counting, and Madden's like, I already refuted it. His refutation was just him telling us what he thinks the text is saying. That was him refuting me. So they think just stating what how they want to take a verse is them refuting an argument. And I point out to him that, yeah, that's that's not a refutation. Yeah, you didn't actually yeah. deal with what's going on in the text. You just put a bunch of words together. Uh, just stringing together a bunch of words in a sentence is not a refutation of anything. Just telling people what you think a verse is saying is not refuting someone else's reading whatsoever. And for them to conflate the two uh, shows you that they they only care about their theology. They don't care about the text. They do okay. not care about the text. They also don't care about listening to what anyone else has said they think themselves are the expert and everyone can't disagree with them so it's it's really a valid appeal to authority they're the authority and however they read something must be the true reading no matter what and no one else can disagree them just stating their opinion is setting down facts and that's their mindset standard rules of actual hermeneutics which would require I think he has a bachelor's degree in economics and something in, in one of the sciences or something. So this is where James White gets into credentialism. And this is... I mean, he shouldn't go down that path. <laughs> yeah, he should, it's a really bad idea for someone without real credentials to be talking about credentialism. But one thing I've noticed from my studies, and uh, I got a political science degree, computer science degree, minors in math and economics, probably the only useful college classes were those math classes because I wouldn't do math on my own. I wouldn't be like, oh, let's go do some calculus today and do some like derivatives and integration of numbers. Um, so the, my math classes actually forced me to study math, whereas my computer science classes taught me nothing new. My political science classes yeah. taught me very little new, only the specialized courses like uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. I had a whole course on 
on the different countries and how they reacted to uh, the fall of communism. And so that kind of taught me some things tangentially, but for the most part, my credentials is just signaling and, and white yeah, well, noise. Yeah. Yeah, but you have to watch. So they attack you on your credentials, but then you you've quoted two or three people already who have credentials. He's not going to attack them. You're saying exactly what they say, but he attacks you based on credentials. So what's actually he, he's demonstrating that it's not really about the credentials at all. He doesn't well, care about that. It's just that he's, he will use whatever he can to try to disparage and dismiss the person he's arguing with and if you, they don't have the credentials you you go for their credentials if they do then you just sort of hand wave for another reason right so i don't know if i quoted any of those people in the actual debate i might have i might have mentioned mark smith because uh that, that name it, it doesn't matter if it's in the debate because he's definitely still not going like it's not like he'll suddenly take them seriously if they have the credentials right he, he will not take mark smith seriously just because he has the credentials so what he's already telling you credentialist attack is that he's really just trying to do a smear job he doesn't care about the argument he's just trying to find excuses to dismiss a person yeah absolutely and so a general rule in in life is uh, there's a lot of experts on a lot of subjects with all the right direct credentials and you just have to look around and you're going to find someone who agrees with your position <laughs> on something I think yeah. it was, uh, who was it? I was dealing with uh, a guy on the reading of uh, Acts 13, 48, uh, whether the people are are uh, appointing themselves to eternal life or not. And he's like, all these experts disagree with you. So I started going through these experts. And not only did not they not uh, actually address my point oftentimes, but some of them actually agreed with what I'm saying and pointed to other experts who did agree with the exact things that I was claiming. So him trying to dis dismiss me based on a list of experts was uh, just completely fallacious on him himself. He, he needs to actually deal with the argument and deal with the experts because him trying to claim that I didn't have expert backing on my belief pointed me to all sorts of experts who were backing me. And a lot of the experts he's pointing to, some of them just hand waved my position. Oh, it obviously they can't appoint themselves. Oh, really? Is, does that what, is that what the text says or is that your presupposition? Yeah. And so there are a lot of experts out there. There there will be people that agree with your beliefs, no matter what your belief is. And so you can't just use this credentialism. Oh, you don't have the right uh, letters behind your name. Oh, also, did I, did he know? He might not know that I got an honorary doctorate in theology. So he <laughs> he might want to he might want to take that back. Does, does that mean you have as many credentials as he does? I do have as many <laughs> and as valuable of credentials as him <laughs> in theology. So when it comes to James White and me, I might be on equal footing there. We might uh -huh. we might be peers, myself and James White. Uh, are you more published than him, or are you equal there? No, too? he's got all sorts of nonsense books out there, and way more hours of podcasting than me. But most of his podcasts are dramatic pauses, so you got to probably cut that number in half. Uh oh, where where did my screen go? I got to pull it back up. My, my laptop keeps timing out. Okay, come on, James White. It's a minor in something. Uh-oh. That's it, as far as I can tell. There it's up. It's up. said in what I've heard. There we go. So nothing in the biblical area. And so yeah, what nothing. You do is you, well, basic reading. Well, well, yeah, my honors thesis was actually in uh, the Hellenization of Christianity, a uh, Platonizing of the Christian church. And so there is something. There's, there's some credential thing that I did do that went through a rigorous process with multiple reviewers that was published and owned by the university about Platonism and the Christian church. So under my name, I do have a little bit, maybe a little bit of uh, authority to say there are Christian Platonists and James White is a Christian Platonist. Maybe I might have something to that effect. University. If there's a university stamp on something, it means it's legit. Naturally. <laughs> uh it's i i've been sometimes you deal with people who um haven't gone to college and they think that the people who go to college are like so much smarter than the average people and they're it's so prestigious it's like you, you, you guys have never gone to college i yeah. had a, a subordinate going through a master's program and like half the people in the master's program were like barely literate people and they're, they're going to get passed yeah. These universities want your money. They're going to give you that master's degree, even though you're lower IQ than the average population. 
Yeah, so there's a there's actually a trend right now that I called imposter syndrome, where basically people are told over and over and over again that the experts are very proficient. They know all the things about the specific subject, and they should be able to um, be the authoritative source on X, Y, Z. And then what happens is that they go through these training programs, they get the degree, and they realize they don't know anywhere close to what they thought an expert is supposed to know to be called an expert. And yet now they are the ones being called an expert. And what's funny with the, the imposter syndrome is that the general advice to people who are feeling it is to just say that you're an expert and, and fake it anyway. Fake it until you make it. That's the advice, yeah. Well, they have already made it, So, but, but they've made it through faking it. <laughs> Because they are imposters. The real, the, the lesson that they should have been learning the second they get the degree and feel like an imposter is that everyone else is really imposters too. And that there's the credentials are, are a very poor indicator of a person's knowledge of a particular subject. But instead, because they're trying to preserve the value of these credentials, they instead tell you to just fake it and declare yourself a very strong expert on it, even if you don't have the expertise. And even worse than that, you read uh, like Arnold Kling or uh, Brian Kaplan about inbreeding in a lot of these prestigious programs. So in economics, um, if you're not a Keynesian, the Keynesians, they, they, they put out all these graduates and they send their, their protégés to the top universities, which perpetuate a system of uh, a certain type of thinking. And so you get a lot of inbreeding and people uh, compiling on, on what's an accepted thought without allowing actual intellectual discourse. And so there, there, there's an additional problem of um, not being able to interact or understand opposing ideas and uh, being very self-selective in what you consider scholarly. Uh, so like, like someone in the Austrian economics field might not be able to get a voice, get a platform. They, they don't yeah. get to determine what, what is popular and what is heard and what is considered for public debate because it's being controlled by this in-group. Yeah, so tying it back to James White, basically the only people he will accept are people who graduated from the specific universities he wants them to graduate from and repeat specifically what he wants them to repeat. And so this argument for credentials is not at all an argument for credentials at all. It's just a posturing uh, for for his position, which he will immediately abandon if it ever if someone has credentials against him, or he'll just completely change the goal. He'll shift the goalposts. It's it's silly. Like anytime they they retreat to this sort of thing, they've already told you they've lost the argument, and so they're retreating to a, the argument from authority. All right. So we'll we'll keep going. We're not too far, and we're maybe like a minute in. No, I don't know. Comprehension. <laughs> okay. Everybody that I know that has basic reading comprehension reads. I All said, my people. Well, Remember, he, he just says he has a blog last a mile about. long. Well, how? <laughs> <Who does he laughs> know? That, that's actually pretty funny. Yeah, he's like, all my friends, like uh, after the election where Trump won, everyone's like, no, no one I know voted for Trump. Well, maybe maybe you're in a bubble world. May, yeah. Maybe that that might be in case the fact. <laughs> God God is measuring the waters because he doesn't know how much there is. That's that's what in the hollow of his hand means is he's he's wanting to gain knowledge. The whole point is he made it all. Is it? And in fact, if you have an actual Christian understanding of the oh. scriptures, actual Christian he sustains all no of true Scotman would believe the open theist position. In whom do all things hold together? That's Jesus. So if all things hold together by the So if this other verse has this one implication, we could take this implication and pull it back to Isaiah. And this if this Isaiah verse has an implication that's different than this other implication and they conflict, then the Isaiah verse is definitely not saying what that Isaiah verse is saying. Because these two verses about different things in different contexts have different implications. Uh, did I get that argument right? Uh, uh, that, that's the implied argument, yes. Yeah, that's his argument. The extension I mean, of it, God's power. It's what? Are you seriously like, sitting there going... In no sense would you look at what, what they're saying here and think this is about sustaining it all. <laughs> Weighing the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance is about sustaining it, calculating the dust of the earth. 
is about sustaining it. Yeah. It's... It is it's not at all like you would never get that from just reading this. So you have, you must be imposing it. And so you must also tell us why you are imposing that interpretation on this. Well, I think we know why. Well, I, I they don't. How much water I made. I'm gonna Mockery. It out in the hollow of my hair. So that's actually funny. Uh, James Madden, not uh, Madden, James. I think it's James Madden. Uh, I, or I might be getting his first name right, wrong. But Madden, in the debate, he's like, well, does God not know this? I'm like, well, we're actually debating what Isaiah believed about this. So I we could like, I guess we could speculate on what he believed or thought. But uh, the text says what the text says, regardless. What Calvinists like to do is, uh, if you're debating a text, they'll say, well, do you believe this one thing that would be as terrible implication if this is true or might lead you to a different... It's not about me. It doesn't... Take me out of it. I'm not part of the conversation. We're reading a verse. What does the verse say? And you can either believe the verse or you don't have to believe the verse if you don't want to. It's, th those are, it's pretty simple. And if you think that's absolutely terrible, if Isaiah thought that God counts in order to learn information, if you think it's absolutely terrible, you don't have to be Christian. There's there's other religions. Calvinists get real mad when I tell them that. They'll say, <laughs> well, do you believe this about the verse? I'm like, well, either you could believe the verse or not. You don't have to be a Christian. And they'll get real mad at me. It's like, if you, if you don't want to accept what the verse says, there's other religions out there. <laughs> <laughs> then I wouldn't be elect. <laughs> oh, oh, that wouldn't feel special. I would lose my entire social strata, my in-group. Oh, it'd be terrible. I'd be wandering around. I'd have to associate with those those neckbeard atheists. <laughs> oh, we. I. I definitely. This. These last couple of months, there was definitely a neckbeard atheist that I was interacting with. It was. It was so funny. It's like, oh man. Uh, oh. Uh, but those are different stories for a different time. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, play for me, James White. You have more faces. Yeah, more, more faces. faces. He's going to give me some faces. I, oh, and he how, goes, how does he do a podcast without the video? <laughs> yeah. There, there, there's like a big pause, Christmas and they're like... What's he doing? So we're going to sit back here for a minute. Oh, beautiful. And we're going to listen to Chris Fisher double down, triple down, send it, down. do it, send it in the cross X discussion part. I love it. He's red pilling his audience subject. right here. Ready? Get a deep seat. All Can right. You demonstrate from our text anywhere where he's gaining knowledge. Yeah, he counts. Isaiah 40, 12. I Good job, me. That. That's not at all what it's saying. <laughs> what it's saying is that he is the standard by which those things are measured. So in the creation account, he is the standard. He uses his hand, and he says, this is how much water I'm going to create. So I have a question for you in regard to that. Well, um, okay, does, go ahead. Can, can God forget? In the Bible? They, they... Uh, so, so, like, look at that. So he's asking me my opinion about things rather than what the debate's about is uh, if Isaiah teaches open theism. And so he yeah. wants to make it about me, not about the text. Yeah. And so I, I have to drop back to the text. There is some parts where there's nations. And in our Isaiah text, there is a part where it sta states that God will forget people's sins. And so the question yeah, is, well, was Isaiah believing that was a literal forgetting of sins? Was it uh, more? I, I was just going to let the whole thing play out, but I just I don't want to forget any of this. OK, uh, you're going to say something or I'll, I'll just let it play. I, I think uh, you're, you're trying to be precise with your response there, and it sounds like you're you're avoiding the question just by tonality. Well, that might be true. It might be the not be the best perception, but you don't want to bring. Will Duffy makes this mistake all the time in his debates. He brings it back to what he believes rather than what the text expressly states which I think is a huge mistake. I think as soon as you start answering their questions by redrawing it to the text, they, they will stop making those types of questions. And I think I experienced that in the debate where he stopped asking me what I think about things, especially if I'm drawing it back to the text, because then he has to answer all these uh, various textual questions. Is it's, that all of your response that he shows? Because he doesn't even show no. your whole response. No, he, he shows more of it. So we'll, we'll play. God okay. gives, I, I, it's, I remove your sins as far as east is from the west. I will forget your iniquities. 
Beautiful. What is that talking about? Yeah, what is it talking about? It's talking about perfect forgiveness. Oh, okay. That means he well, doesn't for, forget. Madden, so, so forgetting exactly. doesn't mean forget. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't mean forget. It might use the word forget, but definitely because it's about perfect forgiveness, there's no actual forgetting in it, even though if it uses the word, uh, because it's about perfect forgiveness. Thank you, James White. Uh, a, ba- a scholar and a gentleman. Uh, what an intellectual giant. Is If God created all the water, did he forget how much he, for- he made? And notice the response. I mean, is, I mean, his presupposition is he knows exactly how God created it. There's plenty of ways to create something. We all know this, where you don't, you literally do not have to measure something to create it. Right. But even if, but even if you are creating it, you're probably going to measure it. Like you're trying to fill a cup to a certain point, or you measure it, right? So he, him measuring it in the hollow of his hands is him is is accounting until it gets to a certain point anyway. Right, so we could pretend, for the sake of the debate, that Isaiah 40 is about God's creation. There's counting involved in the creation. He's, he's, he's creating it, counting it right there. We, we could do that. I don't do it in my Madden debate. I don't entertain that idea, but I, I probably should have just to illustrate how even if their presuppositions are true, it doesn't mean what they want to make it mean, and it's still contrary to their views. It's incomprehensible. It's, it's incoherent. It's a so obvious of a category error that I'm 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 wondering. It's a category error. Two guys up. Yeah, I, I I wish he would explain that. Maybe maybe he does. I don't know. Top, who are the moderators? One of them's got his hand over his mouth. I I'd like to wonder if is is he chuckling? He should be. This is laughable. It's laughable. It's that bad. But there you go. And of course, Brother Madden couldn't laugh because. <laughs> I think I would have, but anyway. of a uh, metaphor, that's an open question, but it is a possibility. Oh, did we, we pause here? Okay. Well, I got to restart yeah, my feed because, uh, it doesn't, uh, it's not showing me the everything going on. So I'll restart that. Uh Oh, where did it go off to? Uh oh, dead air, dead air. So, just tell me what you think. Yeah, it's uh, like he's mostly an argument from incredulity, and then when when you bring up examples, his answer is just to do the very same thing to to whatever text you brought up that he's already done. I've decided God is this way. So the text can't mean anything else. That it's not even legitimate to hear the words spoken as they are it must always mean something else and that's the only way you can read it when instead what's really happening is that the text keeps saying things they don't want it to say so every time they have to reinterpret the text and you watch it their entire system of theology is constantly reinterpreting and everything they read yeah so a lot of uh presuppositionalism as we would put it and not mm-hmm. very much uh, actual arguing with the text or just actually interpretation of the text. A lot of pre- presuppositions built into how they want to take that. And and if you take it, read it any different way, you are ridiculous. You're, you're it, to be it, laughed at. It is funny because he begins with the, like, he knows that the argument is that they're being presuppositionalists, and yet he just cannot restrain himself from doing it. I, he might not even know what the term even means. He might not fully grasp the difference between presupposing certain things about God and learning it from the text. Yeah, I got to restart my laptop because it's not showing me the screen in order to share. Yeah, James James White, I, I've, uh, I've categorized, if you go to God is Open, let's do it real quick. We'll go to God is Open. You probably can't see my screen right now, but we'll... No. we'll We'll just pop in his name, White. We'll just put in White and see some other things he did. <laughs> White versus Jesus. So that's some memes. James White destroys James White on John 644. I forgot I actually posted that. That's uh, an instance in which James White, somebody, uh, he was criticizing some, uh, like a Catholic dude. 
And so the Catholic dude went back and found other James White videos about the same subject in which James White argues like their point. And so then they, they play James White and then they play James White refuting James White on the same <laughs> same comment. <laughs> it was so funny. Uh, he's such a good guy. Uh, there are some really good Catholics. My wife just today, she's like, uh, maybe we should start going, maybe yesterday, she's like, uh, maybe we should start going to a Catholic church because they have all these kids usually. They like have seven kids. Yeah. And then then we wouldn't be so weird as a family with... <laughs> With seven well, they, babies, they don't. They don't just have lots of kids, but they're very tight knit as a community. It's good to see. Yeah, I like it. Uh, that, uh, but I, I told her it, we're only going to go if we can find a Catholic church with that doesn't wear masks. Because the church we currently go to, uh, well, let's see. I got that guy who played the church we go currently go to doesn't wear masks, which is fantastic. Why does this not want to actually? share the actual video i'm losing video i'm losing losing video i don't know what to do ah oh, this is killing me yeah so i don't know what else to do but what what we can do is we could talk about what goes on i i point out to madden that when madden uses the word refute that he didn't actually refute what i said him po positing his own reading of a text is not actual refutation of the text. And I'm glad that James White does, in fact, share that portion of the video. But it goes on like this where he's like, oh, Chris Fisher thinks that God counts. Not me. Not me. Isaiah thinks that. The author of those <laughs> verses thinks that. And so their mockery where it's like, what, you don't think God knows? It's like, you're not mocking me. You're not mocking Isaiah. What, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> and... And so that's why when I'm doing debates, when I advise others on how to frame debates, it's always what did the author believe rather than what do I personally believe or else they're going to do that and they'll think it's an argument. Oh, you believe this one thing? It, it, we're not actually talking about me. Take me out of it. I'm God. What does the author say? And then you have to deal with that. And if you don't like it, you don't have to accept it. There's other options out there. Uh, you could try Platonism. That's pretty fun. Uh, Manichaeanism, if you want to eat, like, if, if you're like a vegan, maybe that's your option because they don't like eating meat and meat products. They just just eat the plants. So it could be a Manichaean. And uh, maybe there's Hinduism. You know, you could do that. I don't know. But you don't have to. There's a lot of religions without the Bible if you don't like what the Bible actually states. <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a wide, wide berth of options. And, uh, I mean, I mean, you're just breaking apart their whole sense of authority. <laughs> I, I know they they use their credentialism for authority, but really, if you just say, "Oh, you, you're not even believing what the Bible says," no wonder they they don't like it. Oh, it's it's I I love I love these interactions. I I love life so much. I don't know if you know this, but every day I'm I'm happy. <laughs> Ill. So James White. In this uh, video, we didn't get to it, but he criticizes me for always smirking. And uh, it's like Madden would make a point, and then my smile would grow larger. And James well, he, White... He just congratulated the other guy for covering his mouth and what he said was a laughter. So right, right. Well, okay, okay, so complete hypocrite. But uh, you see that he is, uh, you know, like in communist Russia, one of the thir first things that they ban is jokes and levity and people making fun of the system because uh, the, the quickest way to undermine any system or series of belief is ridicule, laughter, jokes. And jokes yeah. tend to be the funniest when they have an element of truth in them in which they're highlighting some sort of absurdity. And so jokes are very dangerous, actually. And in communist Russia, you could tell a joke and then go to Gulag for 10 years. Uh, they're... Uh, their little breakouts of uh, how much time you owed were like in five and ten year increments, and so you could get a lot of time for telling uh, a tasty, uh, uh, what a dank joke, a joke that really really kicks. You know, uh, Russian jokes are fantastic. So just Google Russian jokes, and and you'll see all these KGB type jokes. But uh, James White, he really sees that if he's dealing with someone. And this is part of the reason I don't think he wants to interact with me because if I'm smiling during the debate and if my smile grows larger during one of his <laughs> arguments, it's, it is really cutting 
to his authority. He doesn't like it because it displays a lack of treating him as uh, this God figure that, oh, everything you say is to be respected. And that's why uh, Matt Slick really insists that anyone he interacts with needs to treat him with uh, the, this utmost respect that he won't give anyone else because if they're not treated as an authority figure, if they're not treated with with what they feel is worthy of their respect, their dignity, they don't want to interact in that debate because it's all about frame. It's all about frame. If they lose that frame, if they are made an object of ridicule, if I distort his picture and put that up on YouTube, that's a big blow to his personal ego. And so he needs to try to undermine that and cut that. He has to attack me as a person, which doesn't work. It doesn't work if I don't take myself super seriously. His trying to cut me down, oh, it's a futile effort, which is fantastic. It's, it's, it's like judo. You could use their weaknesses against them. And James White's weakness is he's a demigod who has this uh, amazingly inflated ego that can't accept an ounce of criticism. And you, you use that against him. Me, I take criticism all day long. People make fun of me. It's like, I guess it works. It works. It's good times. Yeah. I love it, actually. I love it. And this girl I, I, and I met randomly, she was... I had interacted with her previously. I'm like, oh, what are you knitting there? She's like, I'm knitting a scarf for your big head. I was like, ah, you got me there. You got me there. Ah, good times. But uh, I love it all. It's fantastic. Life's amazing. And and James White's really red-pilling his audience. And so when I use the term red-pill, the red-pill is um, the idea that you understand that the world around you is a carefully constructed narrative in order to keep very unsavory savory people in power. And with James White and the Calvinists, they, they rely on blue-pilling their audience and, and, and uh, shielding their audience from unpleasant truths that might subvert their worldview. So that's why James White will do something like present only what he thinks is my re most ridiculous argument as my argument. He won't go through my whole thought process. He won't go through my various tiered list of arguments. He'll just po point to this one thing. And because he wants to, he wants to frame the world for his audience in such a way that his audience isn't exposed to the truth of the entire issue. They aren't exposed to things that are going to systematically undermine their worldview. But in turn, what he's doing is he, he just pointed them to a debate that they themselves might likely listen to. Ten minutes. Ten minutes opening statement, which I wouldn't change a thing except for that one reference. Uh, I got like one reference I got to change. One reference I would change in which these people now are exposed to this entire other worldview, this system of reading. And the Calvinists, when they're exposed to this, some of them, some of them step backwards because they've been taught that the Bible's their authority. And when they start learning that it's not their authority, some of them take pause. It's a very dangerous to the Calvinists for that thought to get out to the wider world, for those thoughts to propagate that they actually don't care about the Bible as much as biblical scholars, like what we read, the Watts in the biblical theology, like uh, Mark Smith in his uh, where, where the Gods Are. We're talking about the bodies of God, and God has multiple bodies throughout the Bible, which which undermines and counter counteracts uh, all this Calvinism that we are exposed to, which they want to propagate through their through their seminaries. Ah, oh, good times. Now that's fantastic. I love life. How are you doing? Great. I'm great. I uh, I don't engage in these debates like you do, so I I don't. <laughs> get all the flack so i have even more to love <laughs> ah it's oh it's is just the funniest thing in the world to just yeah. one day pop up on james white's radar and he's going off about you like <laughs> god god counts ah, ah yeah. counting god no be? no my co my co-host over here he just fell out of his chair he's on the ground he's shaking it's like convulsive fits over here. God counting. No. Can't do that. Yeah, the shaking. No. It's not stop. It's like it's like there's a hummingbird in here. Attached to the floor. I can feel the vibrations. Oh, but it's fantastic. I love it all. All right. Well, you all, did you have fun today? 
Yeah, it was good. I'll do the Michael Malice thing. What was your favorite part of this whole experience? Because you came in blind. You didn't know that James White was doing any of this. Uh, I think it's just the fact that he sells himself as someone who's open to discuss things and that, that <laughs> ah, you are not. Oh. And, and, yet, and yet the most defining feature about him is how he, closed-minded he is and unwilling <laughs> to have any discussions with anyone who, who might not respect him. Oh, it's so funny. Oh, it's so funny. Okay, so my open challenge to James White is we find a neutral uh, moderator, an Armenian or an atheist. I don't care. Um, not a Calvinist because they like to like try to you know, control debates or whatever. Um, no, Armenian, atheist, neutral debate um, format. And I will use the exact same exact same opening argument as I used with Madden. Word for word, except for like that one reference change. Other than that, the exact same opening argument. I'll have the debate. Does Isaiah 40 through 48, that means you're not turning to other scriptures. You're not saying, well, Corinthians has this one thing. And this implication here means that the implication of this Isaiah verse must mean that this this passage must be read in a certain way to, to invalidate that potential implication that would contradict with some other. No, we don't do that. We don't do that. We look at the text. What does the text say? And uh, how do you read that text? And what internally in that text suggests suggests that Isaiah is a classical theist, uh, that Isaiah thinks that God doesn't have discursive knowledge, that God doesn't think things and has this eternal, absolute knowledge of all things, or even predestination of all things, uh, controls all things, has this uh, simple, undefined, because uh, Daniel Madden uh, and the Calvinists are under this assumption that when God says some things, when God decrees things in Isaiah, that it's an eternal decree into the void. And that's one of the things in the debate that I really focused on. It tells us who his decrees are too. It's not an eternal voidless decree. He says, I told you in the beginning, the beginning is when there's people to tell yeah. that he's going to start things. It's not, it's not this Calvinist idea. God is talking to God talking to people is discursive god talking to people is god interacting with the world receiving from outside himself it is open theism isaiah's open this that's it's not an it's not an option calvinism is not an option throughout the bible no one no one thought in those terms they didn't categorize god in those terms it's just so foreign to the text that i think this whole debate is hilarious <laughs> that you're it, it, I think you're right about this red pilling thing. I remember once that that uh, I had brought up to someone, and then this is kind of in a formal setting too, that uh, that there's no evidence for timelessness. And his response was, you know, it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And it was like, in the beginning I opened this book. It's contextual. You, the beginning of what? No, <laughs> and he had no answer. And it's just like that's the end of the discussion right there. He's like, uh. <laughs> yeah, um... it's so funny to watch. Oh, Will Duffy just had a debate, is God timeless? And the guy, he's pulling all these verses about God God uh, experiencing time. One day is like a thousand years. Well, both of those are experiences of time. And he's like, well, you you got to understand that that's how they're describing the timelessness. It's like, that's what you're coming to the verse with. The verse is actually describing how God experiences time. That's the exact opposite, the exact opposite of what point you're trying to make. And... And the guy kept going back to his presuppositions and, and Will Duffy's like, yeah, the problem is here that you're not arguing from the Bible. That's not what the Bible says. You're just arguing that your specific proof text must mean your specific theology, even though it's not stated in the, in, in the proof text. Oh, <laughs> that's what, that's actually what makes open theism so easy to defend. It's like, you just read the text and that's what, yeah. what the text says. You read their proof texts and their proof texts are actually points against their theology. It's, it's literally reading comprehension against, <laughs> against Platonist theology. You'll be yeah. like, well, God must have these attributes because if he didn't, I'd be very sad. I would cry a single tear and, and, and like, I would I believe fall it. out of my chair. <laughs> if God counts, I, Oh, my body becomes unstable. And the chair goes slipping away from me. It flies into the corner because, Oh God counting. That's not what I decided. God, should how, be. <laughs> how could anyone? Oh, he also criticized me in this, in this discussion that we didn't get to. James White criticizes me for pointing out ancient near Eastern texts that also use very similar phrases about God, where uh, Marduk 
controls all things marduk uh, might uh, know beginning from the end or something it doesn't use the beginning from end uh, phraseology but a lot of the phrases used of marduk are phrases that calvinists latch on to for for their specific features of god some of which uh, occur in isaiah 40 through 48 and so he's like What's he doing? What's why is he pulling up these texts? Why is he pointing to these these other phrases? Uh, God is so much different than these gods that these. Why would he do this? And why would he be comparing them? It's like I'm I'm actually literally talking about reading comprehension and your double standard for language that you'll take one phrase saying the exact same thing in one way when it's about God because you really really want it's like it's it's your goal to have God a certain way. So if the phrase is about God. And there's a possible way to construe it to your interpretation. That's what you'll latch on to. Yeah. Whereas if it's well, about anything else, any other subject in existence, you're not going to read it the same way. Yeah, it's also funny that there, there's so much illiteracy among them that they don't even know. Like, if you want to understand Isaiah, like truly understand it, you need to know the historical context that it's in and what it's responding to. And so you need to have some sense of the uh, all other religions <laughs> that they're challenging. Yeah, okay. They so none. They, they know nothing about this, it, but, but they clearly don't because their whole approach to theology is that you don't have to know anything. You just come in and impose whatever you like on it. Yeah, that's 100%. What, what was I reading the other day? It was like lectures on the Semitic religion. And he points out that, uh, you know, these Israelites that are being addressed, like in Isaiah, they legitimately have other options. They legitimately want to move to Baal. They legitimately want to move to Marduk. And why why is it that these are other theological options in their worldview? Is because Yahweh, in their mindset, was, you know, no different. You could substitute a Baal for a Yahweh. You could substitute a Marduk for a Yahweh because in their mindset, they're, they're just similar deities. And so these incomparability texts is about what sets Yahweh apart from these other options that were in their theological vocabulary. And Isaiah's argument is not, oh, God is pure simplicity without any predicates and and uh, he has no change with immutability, and he has this ungenerated note. That's not Isaiah's argument. His argument's actually very practical. God has said what he's going to do and has done those things. And so you have practical evidence is why you should go with Yahweh rather than Baal. He's, he's, he's not making a James White argument, a James White argument against open theists. That's not what's going on in the text whatsoever. It's practical argumentation in order to convince a wayward audience, which James White thinks double predestination. Everyone's predestination into heaven and hell. So arguments are really superfluous. So all everything going on is a facade in Isaiah 40 through 48. It doesn't it doesn't actually affect anything. It doesn't affect God's eternal elect and eternal damned. Um, and it's it's all just preface. Everything's yeah, I, just preface. I don't even know what they think the point of these authors writing anything is. It's like I don't know if they're even considering it from that angle. I, every, it seems just my impression is their approach to everything that they read in the Bible is not what is the author saying? What are they trying to communicate? But rather just how do I, how do I sell this as some sort of grand picture of who God is? Right. Yeah. It seems like the way it's, how do I make the text say something to fit my theology? And then again, in, in argumentation, again, we're going back to that. What do I need to say in order to make you believe my theology? Yeah, I'll, I'll literally say anything, any point to be made. That that is their only metric for success. It it's very cultish, very cultish, and I've pointed that out many times. That th this is a cult. We're dealing with cultists in a cult mindset, and fortunately, fortunately, if we red pill some of these cultists, they might break free of this cultism. And I, I think I did that. Like this last month, I was I went hiking with a, a Calvinist. And uh, I was talking to him, and he's like not a super strong Calvinist. And I was pointing out like Nexus 32, Moses changes God's mind. And then future authors down the line reinforce what happened there. They they just state what happened plainly in the text. It's not this super spiritual reading, oh, God didn't actually change his mind, anything like that. And it was, it was getting through to him a little bit, so much so that he had to acknowledge the inconsistencies in his own beliefs, which is, is very refreshing to see he is getting a little bit He's, he's getting a little bit of truth pills in there. And I, th it, I think what tends to happen is that anyone who isn't like 
super hardcore for, for theology in particular. They they just they're just generally a Christian, right? And Calvinists are the ones propped up as the authorities. Uh, you start making points to them, and they start thinking about it. They're not attached as deeply as the fanatics of James White to these ideas. So, so they're very willing to listen. And so all it ends up being is, do they weigh the authoritarian figures higher than they weigh the, the arguments from the text? And what you find is that lots of people uh, will understand what you're saying and, and feel like that it matters a lot more than whatever. I know, like, I don't know if I've ever ever convinced anyone to adopt open theism but i certainly turned people who were hardcore into uh well it's, it's a very complicated and i don't really know and maybe it doesn't matter in the end kind of mentality well it's hard it's hard to give up your social circles it's hard, it's hard to do that yeah but all right well i think we had a pretty good podcast and we covered the majority of what he said uh, and said about me and said about my father, Craig Fisher, and <laughs> he knows literally nothing, but already <laughs> assumes something. But but he knows everything. But he's he's the expert on my father because uh-huh. I don't know. You know, all I mentioned, I think all I mentioned in the podcast was my dad knows Hebrew, and he's like, I don't think he does. <laughs> I didn't even I didn't even talk about what my dad's position was on anything. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. It's like I don't think he does. Yeah. Oh, it's so funny. Oh, I love it. It's life life is actually really beautiful and uh that's, that's I like to stress that to people sometimes. You just you look at how life unfolds and the hilarity that's going on. And so maybe maybe that's why I'm always smiling into my debates because some of this is really funny. It's 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 funny. Yeah. And, and you and you got to just look at life and it just ah, it's a good time. Be happy to be alive. Be happy to have these conversations. Be happy to interact with these people who make such ridiculous arguments that it's ah, oh, it's fantastic. And if they laugh at you, that's fine too. You can laugh back. James White falling out of his chair. Well, maybe we'll have to buy James White a more stable chair. Or his, his co-host. Yeah. <laughs> invest, in, invest in some stability for his chair. A seatbelt seat or something. <laughs> maybe a seatbelt. And probably a helmet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think that's good. We're about like an hour and a half in, so we're probably going to cut there. I don't know if I'm going to have to edit anything, because I think we filled the dead space. So that'll be good. I already asked you what your favorite thing is. Any parting thoughts for us? I don't think so. Ah, fantastic. Well, I thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedule to go over this fantastic podcast with James White. And uh, I think it good times. Maybe maybe I'll listen to it again is James White's response and see if there's any added value in going over other things. I don't know about that. But it uh, might be good. might be good. All right. Uh, anyone yeah. who's listening, uh, comments, questions down in the comments or start a thread on the God is Open Facebook group. Thank you for listening. All right.